Welcome, Cheeselings. It's episode eight of the most fine dining experience in crime podcasts. I've heard that one of our listeners is a big fan of swears. So, hello, Seb. This one's for you. Fuck! You are welcome. We're back in the land of the werewolf this week. I thought, let's keep it creepy as we're leading up to the best of all holidays, Halloween. It will officially be Halloween when the pound shop or Dollar Tree Dollar Store for American fromage fams has pumpkins and skulls in the window. But I do take umbrage with the single pound used in the marketing though, as most things for sale in the um, pound shop are several of those shiny nuggets. But I digress and may have to make a separate podcast about lies. This episode is the tale of a medieval serial killer believed to be a werewolf. And let's not forget, people back then were as mad as a bag of mad bastards with the side order of bad body odour and probably an STD or 20. Before we get started, please, oh please, go and follow me on Instagram at cheese and crime party underscore podcast or on Facebook, cheese crime podcast or even TikTok cheese and crime party i'd love to hear your thoughts on this podcast and to know if you have any cases you'd like me to cover for a future episode or or something any ideas are welcome as i mentioned last week the cheese review is rip before i od on the salty fatty goodness so here's some weird crime from the world at large a serial killer hunter Superhero vows revenge in Arkansas. Yeah, I know how to not say Arkansas. A vigilante calling themselves Shadow Vision, that really is a shite name, is hunting a serial stubber. They claimed knowledge the serial killer was checking in on Facebook to check activity from the Masked Avenger. Placing said serial killer, well over 30 as you know, using Facebook, you know. Shadow Vision posted, So, this is a threat to you. When I find you, I will show you what I do to serial killers. I am hunting you right now. Bit of a less impressive Liam Neeson, really, isn't it? Off a taken. Shadow Vision certainly does appear to have a bit of a semi for superhero grandiosity. Not only does SV bring down serial killers, but they stated they will also take out high level gang members. That's nice, take him for dinner. Lovely. He should rename himself Billy Big Balls. All right, but he has no receipts for his superhero work so far, though, so I will keep you posted on this one. Now I'm going to get medieval on your ass. No, I like donkeys get medieval on your ass. Let's go! Oh, Peter Stump. Or is it Stoob? Or Stump? Who cares? Sounds like an arsehole. Let's find out why. Peter Stump was born in or around 1530, as records were destroyed in the Thirty Year War of 1618 that lasted until 1648. Maths. His exact birthplace is supposedly unknown, but some sources claim it is a German village called Eprath. As an adult, he was a wealthy farmer in Bedburg, Germany. He also had aliases of either Abel or Abal or Ubel Griswold. That's Harry Potter, isn't it? All that is documented about the said werewolf of Bedburg comes from a pamphlet from 1590, of which two English translations are kept in Lambeth Library and the British Museum. The original surfaced in 1920 by an occultist called Montague Summers. Defo not a pops. It details the crimes and life and subsequent trial and execution of Stump, who was accused of not only being a serial murderer, but of being a werewolf and a cannibal and a little bit of incest. In those days, not only witchcraft, but werewolves were the feared embodiment of evil and would land practitioners and shapeshifters in very, very hot, soupy, deathly, ouchy water. Peter Stump was a widower and by the 1580s was left looking after his two children, Beale, which translates to Sybil, believed to be older than 15, but no other information is known. And a son whose name and everything about him is unknown. If his name was really Stump, it's quite a matter of the universe getting right stuck into matters, as he was missing his leftist of the two hands that generally people folk have. Not always, but usually. So what did you do, Stump? What did you do, Stumpy? After some proper Middle Ages interrogation room treatment, which included the good old rack, which for the uninitiated into medieval torture, requires the suspect to be strapped to a structure that slowly stretches the body until it don't get stretched no more. And as I understand, basketball wasn't that big a thing in 14th century Germany, so I can't imagine anything other than absolute pain and agony was the goal. 
He was accused of being a murdery blood suckerist for a 25 year period, which he confessed to. His rap sheet included killing livestock, men, women and children. And the hand, so going back to the missing extremity, it was believed that in his werewolf form, the left paw was cut off, leaving the only natural conclusion to be that Mr Stump was the werewolf because coincidence. During the confession, he admitted to black magic, which at that time was a big, big no-no. He also claimed to have been given a belt by the devil, which allowed him to metamorphose into a wolf. Shit, mate, you really should lawyer up. You should have just got the lawyer in. What do you do, mate? If I was subject to middle-aged torture... (laughs) Middle-aged torture. (laughs) Middle-ages torture or medieval torture. (laughs) I would be... No, I would say anything. I mean, I'd say I'm a sweaty cactus, I'm a paranoid saucepan, I'm a fucking haunted kumquat. Just stop it. I don't like it. It's not nice. His daughter was sentenced to death with him, accused of incest, along with his mistress, Catherine. They all paid dearly. Next, I will give you an overview of the execution, uh, which was taken off of Wikipedia, I have to confess. As always, Skip, if you don't want to hear this bit, I will give a timestamp. The execution of Stump on the 31st of October 1589 alongside his daughter Sybil, who he was accused of committing incest with, and his mistress Catherine, is one of the most brutal on record. He was put to a wheel where flesh was torn from his body in ten places with red-hot pincers, followed by his arms and legs. Then his limbs were broken with the blunt side of an axe head to prevent him from returning from the grave. Yep. Before he was beheaded and his body burnt on a pyre. His daughter and mistress also had been flayed and strangled and were burned along with Stump's body. As a warning against similar behaviour, local authorities erected a pole with the torture wheel and a figure of a wolf on it. And at the very top, they placed Peter Stump's severed head. Well, shit on a stick. Well, actually, they probably did that and then sold it at the Halloween fair as toffee apples. So, Peter Stump, eh? I guess it's quite hard to judge a case so far removed from the modern day. And there isn't a lot of information about him, only what was in this like 16-page pamphlet, which was all had to be translated. Um, but is it? Is it removed from the modern day? Maybe to know if the guilt of the accusation were true back then is hard to know. But what I think we can take is that we certainly still do have a thirst for the perceived villain and how easy gossip can turn into the facts. That definitely still exists. I think this could be more about human behaviour. I mean, maybe Stump was a terrible person and a serial killer, but he also could have been a victim of, of gossip. We'll probably never know. But I think these tales may serve as a good reason to reflect. I don't know, I'm just a podcaster throwing thoughts into the world. Let me know your thoughts. What do you reckon? Werewolf, serial killer, victim of gossip. Anything else? Any info, suggestions? As always, a warmly welcome. If you're still listening to this episode, uh, if you're a repeat listener, if you've been downloading and following, or if you're a new member of the Fromage fam, I want to thank you so much for keeping me, Lulu McClue, company. So get in touch on the socials, but watch out for Shadow Vision. He everywhere. Hit the music McClue. (laughs) 